That's your okay. Thanks. Um, well, Todd has turned me on. Okay, so tonight we're going to look at a very strange passage. Uh, we're going to look at chapter six. Now, I I had covered we think up to chapter five the last time I was here before COVID hit, and what we're going to look at is chapter six and a, one verse of chapter eight. I made mention of this last week. That one verse. We're going to look at the seven seals, okay, the, um, the seven seals. Now, people interpret this differently. I'm going to show you how I read this, and, um, it, but if you remember the way that I described how I read the text, my big thing is, how am I to respond? That's the big thing. Uh, if I see something like what Revelation is describing, I want to know what the response is that I'm supposed to make. People say, well, what if it's not the Antichrist? You know, okay. Uh, John said, and he, I take John to be the same John as wrote Revelation, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. I tell you, there are many Antichrists here. So uh, if I'm to respond to the big one in a certain way, I have a feeling that I'm to respond to the little one in a very similar way. You know, there, there are antichrists out there. People say, what is an antichrist? Well, an antichrist is someone who opposes Christ. Um, it's, uh, the word in Greek is antichristos. We get our word anti from this. It means someone who opposes someone, or it means it's someone who replaces someone. Okay, so if um, I'm going to respond to the big guy, the Antichrist, in a certain way, not follow him, maintain my faith in Jesus, um, do not follow this guy in any way, shape, or form, then uh, I'm to do that with the little ones, okay? And this is a, this is a difficult topic, uh, but tonight we're going to look at what we call the seven seals. And before we do that, I'm going to have a word of prayer. Then we're going to uh, look at it. And I'm going to explain how I read it and what I think is important in this. So let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, we at this time stop to honor you as the great God. We honor you in your holiness, your otherness. We know that before you, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. And we know that you are the God who is without peer, that there is no one like you. Uh, we pray, Father, that we would be very devout Christians, that we would follow you. We would pray that we would accept your Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we give you thanks for him and what he has done for us. We pray your blessing on us tonight, Father, as we read. Help us to at least in part understand and help us to respond in ways that are appropriate. We pray your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, tonight, um, I don't know if that picture that I put up there showed it up very much. That was an old woodcut of um, what's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When someone wants to pretend he's a bad guy, he says, I'm one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. My younger days, I uh, used to watch, this is embarrassing to say, I used to watch wrestling. <laughs> w, at that time, WWF, now they changed it to WWE, but... Uh, World Wildlife Fund somehow top, talked them out of using the term WWF, and uh, they changed it to WWE uh, Entertainment. In some states, if they, if they presented themselves as athletic competition, they couldn't do what they did. But uh, there were these guys that called themselves the Four Horsemen. Okay, well, they're not the Four Horsemen. Uh, if you look at the text, this text follows chapter 5. Obviously, chapter 6 follows chapter 5, but logically, it's a part of what was taking place in chapter 5. Now, if you remember the 
not the last time we're here, but the last time I taught this, about a year and a half ago, chapter 5 is about a ritual search. Um, there's a scroll that God has, and it's sealed. And they search through the heavenly realm to see if anyone was worthy to open the seal and to look in it. That's a rather strange phrase to, to look at. So, uh, and no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was found worthy. And John's there, oh, John is weeping. And God, the angel said, don't weep. Why? Because the lamb, or, you know, Jesus has been found worthy. He is worthy to open the scroll. Now, what does opening the scroll mean? Well, it means to unleash the things in the scroll. Okay, well, this is a very dramatic scene that we have. Um, so if you turn with me in your book, your Bible, to Revelation chapter 6. Um, in Revelation 6, um, Jesus is presented, first of all, as the Lamb. Now, if you remember, I, I mentioned this last week, when angels look at Jesus, sometimes he is seen as the lion. And uh, when men look at Jesus, they see him as the lamb. You know, rather strange uh, perception. It's obviously saying that it's how we look at Jesus. The angels are going to look at him now as the lion. Now, lion is an image for the tribe of Judah. Uh, David was of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. Okay, and um, so why are the angels see him as a lion? Because in Revelation 19, when we get down there, if we ever get down there eventually, in Revelation 19, he is the, the one who comes with the horsemen of heaven, the angels behind him. However, that literally is going to take place, I'm not sure. It might be all visionary, uh, or who knows, we'll see. Maybe we won't, but someone will see this. And, and Jesus comes, and the angels with him, and they put an end to the wickedness of this world. If you've read um, the Gospels, Matthew, for example, um, one of the things that happens at the second coming is God sends forth his angels, and they separate the sheep from the goat, the wheat from the tares, those type of things. So uh, Jesus is very much a warrior. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, some Jewish people rejected Jesus and still reject Jesus is because they say, our Messiah is a warrior. Well, so is ours. Our Messiah is a warrior. It's just that not yet uh, in the physical sense of putting an end to evil. Okay, so that's why, but when John sees him, he sees the lamb, if you look in 6.1. Then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals. Now, this scroll has seven seals down its seam. Uh, it's like if you... Scrolls are about 35 feet long, 30, 25 to 35 feet long. Um, I gave mine away. I was going to bring it in, but I gave it to the library at whatever that library is called, <laughs> uh, George Mark Elliott Library. But uh, it, official seals, they, they would roll them up. And if you can imagine a scroll about that tall and about that big around, that would be a full book of the Bible. Well, this one would be relatively short, but when you seal them, it means no one can open them without invoking a curse upon themselves. Uh, and so, uh, to have the authority to open the seal is very dramatic. Um, it, for example, the Romans would do this when they would send one of their uh, emissaries out and they would seal the thing. Unless you have the authority, you face the wrath of Rome. Well, if you open the seal, the, the scroll that Jesus has done, you face the wrath of God. So, what does he do? If you look at this, when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, now, if you look at this, there 
this is going to happen four times. That's why they call it the Four Horsemen. But uh, this first time, it's very dramatic. There's slight difference between what he says here and what is going to happen later. Uh, one of the four living creatures, these are the cherubim, seraphim type creatures. I take them as the same creature, the, uh, sometimes called the living creatures. They, they are the creatures who stand in the very presence of God. If there's any being that is near to God, it's these guys. And if you go to Isaiah 6, uh, you've got to compare this with Isaiah 6, my, one of my favorite passages, and it fits in here very well. In Isaiah 6, they shout, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when they shout that, the whole temple shakes. Okay, very dramatic, right? Now listen to this. And when the lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. I, I, can't, even, I can't do it loud enough. So it's just, and I, I envision in my mind, the, based on the Isaiah text, the whole building shaking, the heavenly temple itself. Come. Okay. Now, what happens when he shouts this? Now, here's where we get into some debate among people. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, if you look on your sheet uh, that we have passed out, uh, horseman number one, there he is, number three down below. When seal number one is broken, horseman number one comes out, and I think he represents conquest. Now, here's where the big argument comes in. Is the conquest the church? Now, I, my good friend Johnny Presley, I don't know if you know Johnny, I don't know if he ever came here, you, some of you may know him, he used to teach at CCU, and Johnny says, oh, this is, this, Dan, this is the church. This is the church going out and conquering the world. Okay. Okay, that's an interesting interpretation. Um, other people say it's the Antichrist. Why? Because later in Revelation 19, Jesus comes out on a white horse. This guy comes out on a white horse. And they say, well, it's the Antichrist coming. Well, I, I would say maybe it isn't an Antichrist, but that. The, the third interpretation is, is that it's just the world that we live in. Now, uh, one of the big debates, and I hate to talk about debates all the time, but got to. It's just one of those things that's part of the uh, rigor of this thing. Is, is this something that's only at the end of time, or is this something that's constantly here? Conquest. William Hendrickson, in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, talks about from the time of Jesus to the present time, there's virtually very little time in the world where you can't find someone that's not going out conquering. You know, that conquest is something that men do. What's the purpose of conquest? I like how it says here, this is, he came out conquering, and what's the purpose? To conquer. That's what he's doing. Conquering, why? To conquer. People have this thing. Now, one of the questions, and I put this on the sheet as well, are the horsemen good or bad angels? Okay, are these guys good angels or bad angels? Now, those who say they're good angels, I'd hate to be one of those angels. You, know, you think about what these four horsemen are going to do, and they're not the type of thing that I would want. But there are passages in which angels are called upon to do difficult tasks. For example, when the devil is pictured as going to his final reward, he's going to be tortured in the presence of the holy angels. 
Can you imagine having to watch that as an angel? Well, that's one way that people look at this. Or is this a bad angel? Uh, this is like Job chapter 1, chapter 2. Well, in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, um, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh. And that's the name of God in the Old Testament. And the Satan was among them. That's what it says the first time, that he was among them. And if you look at that, there's one of the things that he is allowed to do is he challenges God on the righteousness of Job. And God, for example, says to him, have you considered my servant Job? He's a just and upright man, fears God, and turns from evil. Okay, you can read Job 1. The same type of thing is said in Job chapter 2. God will allow evil to do certain things. Uh, for example, in the first, in chapter 1, he's allowed to touch what Job has, but not allowed to touch him. Because God trusts Job. Now, this is one of those hard things to deal with is, you mean, God allows Satan to touch me, hurt me, if he trusts you. That's, God trusts Job. Chapter 2, he will give him a little more permission, and he will say, you can basically touch him, but you can't kill him. Now, one of the things that we'll learn about Satan, if you study that passage in Job chapter 2, is Satan takes it to the limit. He takes, I, I think he's still afraid of God, uh, even though he wants to exalt himself and make his throne like the throne of the Most High. He's still afraid of God, and he still must obey him, so he takes it to the limit. He doesn't kill Job, but he's almost there. Okay. Now, this is something that you, you have to study a lot on. But so, is this the permission to the wicked angels, you can go out and do this, you can deceive people. And at times we look at people who are conquerors and say, that's almost demonic, isn't it? I've been watching again things on Adolf Hitler, all sorts of documentaries are coming out on him. Some of them are colorized. You know, however they do that, take black and white film and make it into color. But uh, Adolf Hitler, his thing is conquest. You look where he, he was a megalomaniac. He wanted to take not just Europe, but he wanted to take Russia. Have you seen how big Russia is? That's a huge country, you know. And um, he wanted to take Africa, and he wanted to take Britain. And eventually, they think he wanted to take the United States. He wanted to, why? Conquest. Why you conquest? To conquest. So I'm going to take this, when I read this, like Job 1 and 2, and I think that, that what God is doing is allowing evil to do certain things. But one of the things that we learn if we study Scripture, sometimes evil fights against itself. It hurts its own. I live in, if you know Cincinnati, I'm assuming you do, I live in Price Hill. You know, I see the, the ravages of what evil does to its own. Uh, I have three neighbors that are Christians, and one of the things we constantly talk about is how do we deal with our neighborhood? How do we deal with our area of town? And I admire my next-door neighbor, Patty, a whole lot. Patty is one of those people who goes out and tries to do something. But one of the things you look at is what does evil do to its own? So if these are evil beings that are given permission, which is the way I understand it, then what are they doing? They're hurting their own and the Christians. Now, if you look at, that, that's a quick, quite brief statement, and you're going to read this some way. And the second seal, if you look in verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, 
But notice it doesn't say with a loud voice or anything like that. It just says, he said, I'm going to assume, though, he's got a big voice, come. And um, so um, what happens? And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. And that men would, should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And so, uh, I mentioned William Hendrickson before, and he pointed out that starting in New Testament times, you have these types of things constantly in church history. And there's always somebody here taking peace from the earth. I look at our world right now, and we look at Afghanistan. This is one of those two fellows, or two of those <laughs> fellows, or a combination of the two. But it's, it's, um, it's demonic power taking peace from the earth. But I, I find it interesting, again, that this idea that these things turn against their own. What do they do? They kill each other. This is very much like an Old Testament story. Um, it's like the story of Gideon, if you know in, in the story of Gideon, if you know in the book of Judges. Uh, Gideon uh, was going to take the Israelites out, and they were going to go against the Midianites. And God said, no, your army's too big. <laughs> and they keep reducing the size of the army. Finally, he gets down to 300 men. And you can't defeat a Midianite army with 300 men. Now, you may not know this, but the Midianites were slave traders. If the Midianites win, they're going to make slaves out of people. And in the battle, they go at nighttime, and they're carrying lamps, and they break the container, that, and the fire flares up, and the Midianites are, whoa, what's going on? And they start fighting, but they start fighting against each other. They start slaying each other. And this is part of the madness of the world system that we are in. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see in Afghanistan if they start fighting not just the European-type nations, but they start fighting each other. And they'll, they will slay one another. So this is the nature of war. And so this is, um, you have conquest and you have war. Now, let's look at the third seal. Uh, the third seal, um, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come! And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who had a, sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, Now, wait. Notice it's not just the creatures that are saying something, but this voice. Who is the voice? Well, what's in the center of the four living creatures? It's God. If you check out, um, for example, Isaiah 6, I keep referring to that one, Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, the, what's in the center is the very presence of God. And so I'm going to read this. As God saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius. Now, how much is a denarius? A day's wage. So, what is going to happen in at least part of the world is that a, a person's virtually hand to mouth, hand to mouth. We think we have it bad here at times, but we don't have it bad compared to some of these people. You know, they live hand to mouth. Um, I watch some of these missionaries in Africa, watch and just people digging through garbage for food, hand to mouth. A day's work produces what? Your daily bread. And a quart of wheat, and um, a quart of wheat, you see, around a quart, the um, amount of things, around a quart, a 
quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wage. And three quarts of barley for a denarius, a day's wage. Well, I guess you're going to buy barley <laughs> if you're going to eat and you have a family. And then he says, do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, what's that? That's the upper class food. So this is one of the natures of what evil does in our world. It's allowed to. And it's actually an act of judgment on sinful men. Now, we're going to come back to this. And then the fourth seal, when the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. This is um, the color here. Your translations will do various things, but it's the, it's the, it's the color of a dead body. I, I, I hate funerals. My friend Jim and I talk about whenever he does a funeral. He's one of my best friends in life, but I'll make reference to Jim quite often because we talk about this. But one of the things, he, he's a biker minister, but he's a biker. Had to sell his bike when he lost some money, and, um, but he does funerals for bikers. And he said one of the most successful funerals he ever did was he didn't know what to say, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, God, get, help me say something that's worthwhile for these guys, because they're all, vroom, vroom, you know, and type of guys, bikers. And uh, he, he gets up, and he said, his opening line, he, they're at the graveside. It's just a graveside service, and he says, I hate this place. And we then got talking about what do we hate about funerals. Now, sometimes they make the face look like it's as much alive as you can, but at times when you go into that funeral home, you see that face, and it's so pale, and it's death. It's just the, the, the face of death. And so this, this horseman, um, he, the horse itself has the color of death. And notice, and he who sat on it had the name death. And Hades was following with him. Is that another horseman or is that someone walking behind him? But uh, Hades is the abode of the dead. Authority was given to them over fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So the them, is that the, just these last two guys or is this all four horsemen together? I'm going to read it as the four horsemen together. Now, this is an act of judgment to me. Um, God allows evil to take place. That's one of the most difficult topics in Scripture, God allowing evil to take place and God doing judgment at the same time. What do we, how do we explain this? Two reasons, two ways I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to explain this as what we call intrusion. What is intrusion? Um, nice theological term. It works two ways. Um, I think the last time I was here I explained this, but go with me to the book of Hebrews. This is a good way. Chapter 6. Now, I'm going to read this text up just up to a point. Uh, verse 4, for in the case of those who have been once enlightened. Now, he's going to talk about the person who totally abandons Christianity. But he was in the person who is really, really, really a Christian and leaves. That's what he's dealing with. A very difficult topic. The person who was once enlightened and has tasted the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? All sorts of things. Salvation. Uh, that's, that's a heavenly gift. The gifts of the Spirit. The, the Spirit Himself in our lives. 
um, and has been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. He gets to that in the third thing. And have tasted the good word of God. And then the last thing he lists on here of the person who abandons Christianity and the powers of the age to come. Now, that's an excellent description of what it means to be truly a Christian. You have partaken of the powers of the age to come. Um, I like um, my friend John. I uh, forget who he's quoting. He, every, uh, teachers steal everything that's good. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> any of you, I don't know how many of you are public school teachers, but you, you're not teaching just things that you know yourself. You're borrowing from every place of the sun. And this one guy pictured Christianity this way. He said, it's now but not yet. Now we get to experience things like the powers of the age to come. We, we, we can live a resurrected life. But uh, read John chapter 5. Uh, let's just do that because I have to explain this. Um, I'm going to make sure of my time here. John chapter 5, the Gospel of John. John has this very much as a part of his theology. Uh, if you look in verse um, 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man, or Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, notice what he said there. It's it, coming, and now is. See, the future has I like this word, intruded. It's like, uh, you know, an intruder in your house. The future has jumped into our present to a degree. The hour is coming and now is when the uh, dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him, him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Verse 27, 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, but it doesn't say now is, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who have committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. See, that's the future. But verse 26, or 25 and 26 is talking about what happens in the present. So the present, the future comes into the present. You are resurrected with Christ. Okay, great, great doctrine. Except it also works in the area of judgment. Um, if you study the subject of Sodom and Gomorrah, what did they get? They became an example of eternal judgment. See, the, the future, eternal judgment, came into their present. It jumped into their present. Uh, when you um, look at Old Testament passages, there's a, a, a guy, I got to meet him before he died. I always grieve when certain people die. Well, I try to grieve when everybody dies, but you know, there are certain guys that were just excellent scholars. And this guy's name was, uh, I don't know what his first name was, but I met him once, had lunch with him, uh, J. Barton Payne. And he wrote the book, the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. And he would take every prophecy, I think, in Scripture and say, it's either been fulfilled or it's still future. And if it's full fulfilled, we don't, have, we don't have to wait for a later fulfillment. Not everything is in the future. Like there are Old Testament passages about judgment upon the country of Edom. Well, we don't have a country of Edom anymore. But the country of Edom has been judged. Why? Because the future has jumped into the present. You know, at times God brings it. One of my least, I don't want to say favorite, but one of my favorite passages on the idea of intrusion is Ananias and Sapphira. 
We know that cute little song, Ananias and Sapphira. They did conspire, or whatever it goes, I can't sing. I'll, 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 I'll absolutely nauseate you with my singing. But uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they did conspire to lie to the Holy Spirit. And what did they do? They both dropped dead. What did God do? He brought their future into the present because they were doing something probably much greater than what the text reveals in their own heart and their own life. They're lying to the Spirit of God, and they drop dead. See, the future came to the present. We can find all sorts of references in Scripture. So, what I'm thinking in this passage in Revelation chapter 6, let's go back there, is that these four horsemen are in part God bringing the future into the present. Now, people then ask, well, what about good people who die? Well, I have two responses. Number one, Jesus taught that no man has lost father and mother and brothers and sisters and houses and lands for my sake, except I will restore him to him either in this life or in the life to come. You know, so sometimes when... Uh, Things happen unjustly in defense of God, I would say, he will restore to us what we have lost. And there's a lot of this going on in the world, I, I believe, you know, that sometimes I, I grieve um, my, one of, two of my former students just lost their second baby. And I grieved for them, I prayed for them and pray for them. Because evil has touched them, but it's been a testing of their faith. I even called them up, and I called the husband up and talked to him. And I assured him that, you know, God is able, in, either in this life or in the life to come, to restore what was lost. And if you look at, for example, again, let's go back to our friend, the book of Job. In the book of Job, what happens at the end of the book? God restores to Job what he has lost, and his end became greater than his first, the first part of his life. Now, that's in this life, uh, but I, I don't know how to explain this better. I wish I did, but in, in this life, we sometimes lose. Sometimes it's for the sake of the kingdom of God. Um, my, uh, I was contemplating this once when my wife and I were in our first job. <laughs> and I, I think I mentioned this before. I'm what my one good friend John, I mentioned John before too, but John called me the closer. I've worked for two Christian colleges and they both closed on me. <laughs> and uh, he said, Dan, don't go and work for any other school, especially the one I work for, because it will close. Okay, but that first school I worked for, it was a great place in some ways and a horrible place in others. My first job, I, first year I made $4,200. How did we live? I have no idea how we lived. Okay. But we did. But one of the things I lost was my mother and father. They didn't die. They were 300 plus miles away and we couldn't afford to drive to see my mother and father. Occasionally we could afford to call them on the telephone. Hey mom, how's it going? Can only talk for a few minutes. How about calling me back? <laughs> you know, kids play that with their parents. But uh, one of the things, and I prayed about this, you know, either in this life or in the life to come, how, God, how about restoring to us what we have lost? I really missed my parents. Um, and God fulfilled that two ways. A, a good friend of mine named Martin, he comes up to me and said, Dan, how, how about coming over to lunch on Sunday? And Sunday after Sunday, Martin would invite me over. Martin became like my father to me. He wasn't my father, but he became like a father to me. See, in this life, he gave me what I had lost back. 
And then in 1996, my mother and father moved in with me. <laughs> so what I lost temporarily, I gained, and I kept them both until the day they died. See, we, we can't figure out how God restores. And I know this, that when I, I cross over into that life that's everlasting, my mother and my father will be waiting for me, you know. Uh, my friends, Martin, the guy I called my father, will be waiting for me. Elizabeth, his wife, will be waiting for me. See, we, we have a hope that goes beyond this. Now, let's look at the fifth seal. What's the fifth seal? Now, this is, I think, the reason that God sends judgment upon the world. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of them who had been slain. Now, is this the altar of sacrifice, or is this the heavenly altar of incense? Um, in the temple, there are two altars. One's a, the altar of sacrifice, and some people read this this way. They are the people under the blood of Jesus, okay? Or is this the altar of of incense, which represents the prayers of the saints. And I'm going to, I read it that way. Um, but why are they there? Now, this is very important because we're going to pretend like this is the Holy of Holies up here. <laughs> well, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was an inner part to the temple where only the Ark of the Covenant was. Um, and that's the very presence of God in the temple. It's symbolic. But right, right at the edge of that, there is a curtain, and then there is a little, not much bigger than this, if bigger than this, little altar that's the altar of incense. And on Day of Atonement, the, uh, the, in the Old Testament temple, the incense, which are the prayers of the saints, is taken from that altar and taken into the Holy of Holies. So where are the martyrs? The souls of them who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the word of the testimony which they had maintained. They are in that little altar that's so near to the presence of God. While why does God send judgment? Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, one reason is these people want to conquer and for the sake of conquering. People want war. Um, what people do produces famine, which produces death. Okay. But um, another reason is they kill the saints. This is part of the, our sadness these days with those believers in Afghanistan and other places. It's not just in Afghanistan. Is they kill the saints. And they ask a very important question. They, they cried out with a loud voice. Now, see, we have these angels booming out, come, 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 come. And then we have... The saints crying with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This is, this is one of the things that God calls us to. Uh, people say, well, when is this going to take place at the end? Well, probably. But also throughout church history this has taken place, that the people who are truly the people of God will be slain. Uh, one of my, I went to a school in the middle of Ohio, in Ashland University. I went to their graduate school, and I studied um, Old Testament there. And the, uh, they were what they call Anabaptists. That's not a Baptist. This is not a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a different type of thing. They're the, Brethren, the Brethren in Christ, the Church of the Brethren, the Mennonites, those type of people. 
uh, very, very much like Church of Christ people. Um, very seldom did I hear anything I didn't agree with when I went to the classroom. But one of the thing, in one of the classes, I had to read this book. Forgive me if I can't. Remember. This is like forty some years ago. Come on, I read a book, uh, Ten Who Dared, or something like that. And one of the fellows, I can remember his name was Dick Willems, which sort of in modern English would be Dick Williams. Uh, but Dick is spelled in a strange way in Willems. But um, I remember this guy who's a very peaceful man. Um, some of them are full-fledged, what do I want to call them, pacifists, okay? They wouldn't harm a flea. Others are saying, no, we fight defensive wars, but we don't fight offensive wars. You know, we don't go out and conquering, but we can defend ourselves. And a big debate among them. But Dick Willems was one of the people who wouldn't hurt a flea. And when he, when they found out the quote-unquote Christians who had the power, okay, you can figure this out, they came after him. Now, at this stage, they weren't killing the women and children. They were just killing the men. And this is one of those people you just want to see in the heavenly realm and hug that guy and say, you know, whatever you have received, I, will, I, I would say amen to this. And they were coming, and they saw him coming across the field. And so he ran out the back door of the house. Houses should have back doors so you can run out them. But uh, he then ran down into the valley, and, and this is in the dead of winter, and he runs across the ice. And when he's running across the ice, it's not thick enough, and he hears it cracking behind him. And the fastest of his pursuers comes to the thing, jumps on the ice, and falls through. What does Dick Willems then do? Oh, no. I can run away, but I can't leave this man dying in, under the ice. Okay? And he goes back and pulls the man out. They took him. Even though he had saved one of their people from drowning. Because I don't know if you... See, I was a country boy, and, you know, sometimes when you break ice, it will tip up, you'll go under the ice. That seems to be what happened with this guy. And he saved his pursuer, and they executed him because of the word of his testimony. And if it will quote this passage, and he did not love his life even to the point of death. See, Sometimes we are irrationally persecuted by the world. And that seems to be what happens there. But notice how God responds. We are called upon to be ready, not seek death, but to be ready to forfeit life and property for God. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they were, had been, would be compl completed also. The Christian has to face the possibility of loss, not just loss of property but the loss of life. When, if we eventually get there, one of my favorite passages is in Revelation 20. There's a big debate on this passage as well. Um, but as verse 4, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. 
One of the cruelest ways of executing somebody in both the New Testament world and even in today's world is the beheading of a person. In Roman times, um, I don't know if you know the traditions, but the Apostle Peter was crucified. And he asked to, supposedly asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to be, he didn't mind being like his Lord, but he just didn't want to be, so they crucified him upside down, which is very cruel. It's a quick death. The Apostle Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was supposedly beheaded. They would not crucify Roman citizens. They would behead them. Which is a way of saying this person who was beheaded, this is, this is, was willing to sacrifice even to the point of denying his Roman citizenship. Okay? Modern world. Um, I don't know if you know the thing with Saddam Hussein. His head came off when they hanged him. Um, and the United States took his head. And, oh, great offense. Why? Because when you chop someone's head off and remove their head from their body, even in modern thinking, quote-unquote thinking, this is the depraved thinking, but it means that you are not worthy of everlasting life. That's the modern take on it. But it, it's, it's a loss of the greatest order. So what, are the, what happens here? Now, so these are five conditions that I think will take place from the time of the resurrection of, ascension of Jesus until the present time. We'll have conquest. We'll have war. We'll have famine. We will have death. And we'll have martyrdom. So ultimately, what does he do? This is, uh, he takes us then to the sixth seal. And this one's very easy. Uh, it's judgment day. This isn't the intrusion of judgment. That's seals one through four. This is the final judgment. This is the thing that's jumping into the present. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Whatever literally takes place, this is figurative language to describe some great climactic event. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And I mentioned this last week, I believe. Uh, this is odd. These people are afraid of the Lamb. Jesus, sweet Jesus. They're afraid of Him. I can't explain why it is that men are not attracted to Jesus. My, some of my favorite stories in the New Testament deal with Jesus dealing with sinners. The woman at the well. I don't know if you've seen the show, The Chosen. It's one of my favorite episodes off The Chosen. The woman at the well. And, and he told me everything I've ever done. And they did that really well in that. I know it was a drama, but but Jesus forgives her. The woman caught in adultery. Um, I love the imagery here. They bring this woman. Jesus gets down 
It just starts writing in the earth. People say, what was he writing? I don't care. He's looking down. Why is he looking down? Because usually they strip the person who is accused of this crime. Naked. It's not really a trial. They ask him to pass judgment. Now the question is to get up. I'm going to stay down for a moment. And... Okay, why is this an illegal trial? Because you can't have a woman caught in the act. You have to have a woman and a man caught in the act. Where's the man? You know, that would be all sorts of violations of law here. And don't tell me you don't know who the man was. Everybody in those little towns knew everybody. You know, we know where this guy is. But they only wanted to do... They only wanted to accuse the woman, wanted to stone her, and she's there. She has lost all, and Jesus is writing dirt. And he said, okay, you that are without sin, you've got to re read this as, as Jesus down on his knees writing. In the dirt. You that's without sin cast the first stone. He doesn't hear any stones from flying, or bodies dropping. These people would slink off. Now, I'm going to get up. <laughs> Don't get old. <laughs> you say, what? Yeah, it is not. But uh, Jesus is actually still on the ground, and he's looking down. He says, where are your accusers? And she said, I have none. And he said, I don't accuse you either, but go and sin no more. Did you, did you see the, the greatness of Jesus in that story? The compassion of this man. And he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And these people are, oh, no, it's the Lamb. It's the Lamb. God is a merciful God. And yet, men do not want him. And this is part of the reason, I think, for judgment. It's not just what they do to one another. They kill one another. It's not just what they do to the saints. They kill the saints. But it's how they look at God. That, to me, is... the greatest aspect of why men deserve judgment. Men, men don't want God. That's it. What, do we do? what must we do? I mentioned this last week. And unto them that wait, expectantly wait for him, shall he appear with, again without sin unto salvation. Hebrews chapter 9. We should be expecting Jesus. But we should be working to change our world. That's what I want to do. That's what you should want to do. That's, I know Todd back there wants to change his world. I haven't picked on him for a long time. But we should want to change our world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray your blessing upon us as we study these things. Help us, God, to deal with the difficult texts and to think about the texts and to think about you. I pray, Father, that on that day we will not be afraid of you or of your Son, that we will lead many souls to Christ. To the Lamb. We pray, Father, that we would endure the things that are taking place in this world and that we would minister to those who are hurt by these things. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.